This is not a drill. The Cardinals are expected to get Lars Nootbaar back in the lineup on Friday night in Arizona. But does that mean Victor Scott is heading to Memphis after his tough day on Wednesday? Not so fast. Coming up on b Shave Daily. What's going on, everyone, and welcome in to this edition of B-Shape Daily. Brendan Schaefer here with you. It is Wednesday evening, April 10th, 2024. Ah, boy, the Cardinals, they lose the Philly series. They drop game one, of course. They get the big win from Sonny Gray in game two on Tuesday and Wednesday afternoon. Yeah, the Redbirds let one slip away as we're going to have to talk about it. Victor Scott II did not have a great day at the ballpark. And that sent social media into a frenzy because there are a lot of Cardinals fans who are taking a look at that batting average of his and saying, hey, maybe it's best if he goes back to the minor leagues, gets some more seasoning in AAA. But on the other side of that conversation is the fact that Victor Scott has been playing really strong quality defensive center field. And when he does find his way on the base paths, he does some damage. He can wreak havoc as a base runner. But unfortunately, those two areas of his game, which are supposed to be the constants, right? Those are the the two elements that also failed him on Wednesday in kind of in a major way. As the Cardinals lose to the Phillies 4-3, to three, there was a really costly error by Victor Scott early in the game on a catchable ball. Yes, it was in deep center field. Yes, he kind of got turned around. Yes, it was a rainy day at Bush Stadium. Victor Scott's not making any of those excuses, and I won't do it on his behalf. That's a ball that he needs to catch, and he knows it. But I think the other part of it is that's a ball that most of the time he does catch and is going to catch throughout the rest of his professional baseball career. As Ollie Marmel framed it, he made an error. He's going to make more of them throughout the rest of his career. That's the first one. There will be more major league errors by Victor Scott because, look, Victor Scott, I think we all believe, has the potential to have a long and prosperous career, and you're not going to get them all. Not every day is going to be your A game. And Victor Scott didn't have his A game today, but I think it's a little bit irresponsible to use that to say, well, that just means it confirms everything we already believed, that Victor Scott shouldn't be in the big leagues and the Cardinals should send him down. And in fact, they should do it right now because Lars Nupar is a coming. Lars Nupar expected to join the Cardinals on this road trip and be in the lineup as early as Friday night in Arizona. The report coming from Katie Wu of The Athletic, if others have also shared the news and, and reported the information, I haven't seen it, but it did pop up from her on my timeline, so I'll go ahead and get that information for you. She posted a story that she wrote for The Athletic and then retweeted that story and said, also within this story, Lars Newbar will be activated off the IL and will make his 2024 debut on Friday against the D-backs. Pedro Pajes will be the corresponding move. That's from Katie as of a few hours ago on Wednesday night. So if Pedro Pajes is the move to bring Newt Barr back to the active roster, that decidedly means that Victor Scott will not be the move, will not be the player heading to AAA Memphis in a corresponding move for Newt Barr rejoining the roster. And there was some speculation after what we saw Wednesday afternoon, which was objectively not a good game by Victor Scott II, But there was some speculation that perhaps because of that and it all sort of coming to a head that his offensive numbers have, you know, continued to stay pretty dormant. He has not been too much of a threat at the plate. And then you see the defense slip with the costly error. Lance Lynn out there on the mound ends up giving up a couple of runs in that first inning of work. And, you know, it wouldn't have been the case if Victor Scott catches that ball. Neither of the runs against Lance Lynn on Wednesday were earned. He goes five innings, gives up the two unearned runs there from the first inning error after Scott just has it go off his glove. He got turned around. It was in the rain. You can make the excuses. That's not something Victor Scott's going to do, though. And so, like I said, I don't need to to really engage much in doing that on his behalf. And I was not at Blue Stadium on Wednesday. We had some different family things going on this morning. Everything's good to go. But I want to read some of the quotes from Victor Scott from after this game because I think it's relevant for Cardinals fans to hear. I've got this from John Denton's story writing for MLB.com from Victor Scott. Quote, one thing that kind of stands out to me, and this is all Victor Scott talking, by the way. One thing that kind of stands out to me is something that Nolan said to me 
and that's that you can't hide up here. Scott said after the Cardinals 4-3 loss to the Phillies, quote, every mistake, every little thing you do and every little thing you say, it's televised. People can see it. I'm not perfect and I'm not a robot. I'm going to make mistakes, yes, but I'm going to learn from them. I feel like that's something everyone should know. Yeah, I make mistakes, but I'm going to learn from this, end quote. That's Victor Scott on the horrible, terrible, no good, very bad day that he had at the ball yard with the error in the first, highlighted by the fact that the Phillies score a couple of unearned runs, and then the Cardinals trying to scrap their way back into this game. They get a couple of solo home runs in the second inning from Yvonne Herrera, continuing to do a great job, his third of the season, and then one from Brendan Donovan, his second of the year, coming off of Aaron Nola as well. Cardinals get those couple of runs off of Nola. It's all they would get off of him in the six innings. But two two solo shots makes it a, a clean game once again. You get into the sixth inning, though. Andre Pallante didn't have his stuff today. You you can talk about, well, it's Ali Marmel's fault for bringing him in. Um, you know, I just, I don't know what you expect necessarily to see. I know that people like to play the hindsight game after a game when the bullpen doesn't work out. Today, the bullpen threw four innings. They gave up two runs. Unfortunately, both of them were Pallante's fault. He gave up uh, three hits and a walk to go along with the two earned runs. Zach Thompson comes in and rescues the situation. He ends up having a really nice day. Six strikeouts for Thompson in relief of Pallante there. Three and a third innings, four hits allowed, six Ks, no walks. The velocity was not necessarily ticked back up for Thompson compared to what we had seen in recent days, but that's a notable outing for a guy that's probably trying to keep the roster spot. He'll say, look, I understand you might want me to go uh, stay stretched out at Memphis, but that's that's a notable outing. And Zach Thompson's performance kept the Cardinals in the game. Unfortunately, it was another moment for Victor Scott that kind of helped, helped to take them back out of the game later on in the eighth inning is a rally. It happened. Nolan Arenado had the RBI hit to prove it. There is the potential, though, in the inning for even more to take place. But unfortunately, Victor Scott, the good news is he got a hit. Infield hit, he was able to beat out. The bad news is he made an errant left turn, which you know you can't do, past the first base bag. And that keeps him in play. The Phillies noticed this. I think it was Stott throws to Harper. Harper applies the tag before Victor Scott. And Scott, you know, I think Scott did one of those things where, and I wasn't there to ask him about this, so I don't know what was necessarily said unless I read it in one of the stories. But he did one of those moves where it's like, hey, if you act like you didn't just do that thing, maybe they won't notice. But the Phillies had already noticed, and I would have maybe liked to have seen Scott's camper back to the bag. And Because it's like you don't want to look like you're trying to get back to the bag quick because that might – make the fielder think, oh, he knows he knows what's going on here, and I've got to hurry if I'm going to get him. It's a lose-lose situation, though, once Scott had had sort of ducked that left shoulder. It was really kind of an action of, of slowing his momentum down, but he did. He made a left turn, and this isn't NASCAR, so that's not a good situation there. Ends up getting tagged out. Could have been the beginning of an even more robust Cardinals rally as they were able to, to get some guys at the top of the order going. And Nolan Arenado comes up with a base hit up the middle that scores a run, but they needed another one to be able to tie the thing. And Cardinals were unable to get it going in the bottom of the ninth inning. They had a little bit of a rally cook, and they had a stew brewing with runner on base. But uh, unfortunately, grounding into a double play was Jordan Walker to end the game. And it was Paul Goldschmidt on deck was going to bat for Victor Scott the second if uh, the inning was extended. And it, it should have been if you know, Walker makes even just one out, we still would have seen Goldsmith bat with a chance to make something happen there. And it just was not meant to be as the Cardinals lose it four to three. But Scott making the, you know, the error in the field that costs you a couple of runs to begin the game, eighth inning, a base running mistake when he does get on base. He had a hit. The uh, the batting average is sitting at 091 even after the one for three day. So offensively, we know what it's been. There have been times where it's maybe been not as bad as the numbers indicate in terms of the optics of how it looks. I want to give Victor credit for the sacrifice fly that he put together a nice at bat in, uh, I guess it was Tuesday's game that they won the Sunny gray game. That was a, a key insurance run at the time. You didn't know that the Cardinals were going to be able to hold up and throw zeros all across the board in that game on Tuesday. So the insurance that Victor was able to provide, that was the second run of the game and it was scored on his bat. So I know the average is 091. I know the 299 OPS is brutal. It hasn't been the type of offensive start that he would want. And it'd be nice if a few more of those infield hits could happen 
so that he could feel maybe a little bit better about what's going on offensively. But again, you read those quotes from Victor Scott after the game. Doesn't strike me as a guy that is um, that's necessarily, I don't know, in over his head. I get it that the the common phrase has been that he's overmatched at the plate and that this would have been a natural time with, with Lars Newpark coming up to make a move and get him to Memphis, get him some seasoning. I get all those things. I like that the Cardinals aren't sending Victor Scott out right now. And that's not me saying that I don't think there there could come a time later on this uh, this season, maybe a few weeks even down the road, that that might be the right decision. But I don't think it is the right decision for the Cardinals right now. And if that's if you view that as I'm just doubling down on a guy hitting 091 because that was my take to begin the season and I'm I'm still holding on to it, that's fine. I don't care what you think. I'm going to tell you the way I see it and the way I view it. There's nothing disingenuous about it. That's the reality of what I'm doing here. I think Victor's got the second, has had at-bats where he has looked overmatched. But I think that about everybody up and down that Cardinals lineup one through nine. Because there have been a lot of strikeouts in this lineup. There have been a lot of games where clutch situations come up and the guys aren't coming through. That's true from Victor Scott to Nolan Arenado to Paul Goldschmidt. Up and down this lineup, Jordan Walker, I mean, that has been the case. Victor Scott has a lower batting average than those other guys. I get that. But he's far from the only one getting into those situations. Do I think that Wednesday was the first time that we really saw maybe struggles at the plate bleed into what's going on on the field and and maybe the base running and just kind of that having that little extra layer of pressure to look up and go, yeah, I'm hitting 075. Maybe that is something that happened today. Victor Scott, his quote here from JD's story on MLB.com, quote, and this is about the error. It was a little tough with the hard drizzle, and anytime you look up in the sky there, water in your eyes, but there are no excuses. That ball should have been caught, Scott said. It hit my glove, and I've got to catch it. All right, so look, this is a guy that maybe he carried some some frustrations or some extra. I would say it's more like extra pressure that you carry into the field as a result of the struggles at the plate. It's not that you are carrying those frustrations because that was the top of the first inning. That was a situation where, you know, he hadn't been in the, in the batter's box at any point in time yet in this game. So I think it's just the, the mounting pressure, perhaps. Could we play sports psychologists and say he knows Lars Newtbar is close and that there could be a decision there? But I just don't think that's the way Victor Scott operates. So I don't. I, I don't. I'm. I know I presented a premise that I'm then going to knock down. It's a very. It's a very good uh, solo podcaster strategy. But I, I. I don't think that that's what's going on with Victor Scott. But I do think like in the rain. In the here's the other thing. Is it just because of the rain? No. He's had moments even in the the earlier portions of this Philly series that I noticed with Victor Scott on various routes because I was at both games Monday and Tuesday that I noticed on routes to these balls, he was getting there. He was putting himself in position to make the catch. It just didn't always look clean or totally comfortable. And I think those are the, especially at the big league level, ball ball jumps off the bat differently. You, you the, the, the ramifications of an error are more significant. Nobody wants to be making a mistake in those spots. So, yeah, do I think the pressure kind of ramps up for a guy? It does, and I feel like you could see that a little, I would say just like a little bit of jumpiness. Again, we are reading really deep into this stuff, but when you do a Daily Cardinals podcast, you're going to talk about the minutia that most people go, why are you talking about that? That's just, you know, you're, you're getting too deep into the weeds on something. Yeah, I get it. Do a daily podcast about this baseball team. Uh, we're going to eventually get into the weeds on some of these things. That's just the nature of, of talking for a half an hour to an hour to whatever it is. We did a live stream last night that went an hour and 20 minutes or whatever it was. If you missed it, it's all available on Spotify, Be Shafe Daily. It's all available on YouTube as well. Um, I cleaned up the audio and, and just put up a separate video so you don't have to go back and watch through the live if the the, the video was wonky on that. I, I cleaned up the audio and, and posted that as well to the YouTube. Hit the subscribe button, by the way, youtube.com slash Be Shafer 12 is where we're at here. Lower right-hand corner of your screen on this video, you can subscribe and you will get daily Cardinals content. That is a promise that I will make you as we uh, continue to to cover this team, not only for my articles at KMOV.com, but YouTube, the podcast, the uh, low-hanging fruit with Charlie Marlowe. That goes on his YouTube channel, but you get the picture. We got a lot that we're getting to. Reading here from JD's story as well when it comes to the moment, that pivotal moment in the eighth inning with the Cardinals trailing 4-2. to 
dribbling a ball down the third baseline, top tier sprint speed. JD has the access to the stat cast there because he works for MLB.com. 30.1 feet per second down to first base. So it's a base hit, breaks an 0 for 24 skid, but he makes that instinctive turn towards second instead of veering off to the right. And the Phillies tag him out to begin the inning. Ended up coming back to haunt the Cardinals because if his run is still on the base paths, the way the rest of the inning unfolded, you tie the game. And if the error doesn't happen in the first inning, Lance Lynn probably has a scoreless outing. He probably gets to go deeper than five innings, which, man, can somebody else, uh, Mother Nature, help out Lance Lynn to not have to be pitching in the rain every time he's out there. Five innings, it could have been a little more efficient, the four walks that he gave up, but only gave up one hit. Like, Lance Lynn's stuff was nasty, the six strikeouts. I think he's going to be a guy that strikes out more than, uh, he's going to get more than a K per nine this season, if I had to guess. Uh, Lance Lynn, Stuff nasty. He he does waste too many pitches. That's still a, a little bit of a minor criticism that I had from his first outing uh, against the Dodgers, I believe that one was. 94 pitches, 52 strikes. So the percentage there, not as high as you'd like to see, but it works for him, man. The 2.63 is the ERA for Lance Lynn after Wednesday's outing. But yeah, Victor Scott, it was an unfortunate day. I don't think it's a day that unless you were the Cardinals and you already were saying, hey, we're going to change course from everything we've said, that defense matters, that that prioritizing center field defense and defense up the middle is important to the team this year. It's why you brought Brandon Crawford in in the first place. Back when you thought Tommy Edmond had to be your backup shortstop, they said, no, we're going to have Tommy Edmond be the everyday center fielder. I know that's not germane right now with Tommy Edmond on the injured list, and we still haven't seen him this year. But those are the offseason moves and the spring moves that the Cardinals were making to set up this notion that outfield defense and defense in general matters to the way we're going to construct this Cardinals team in 2024. And I understand it's going to be a little bit of a contradiction to say, hey, defense matters, and that's why you keep Victor Scott when his error is the one that cost the Cardinals today. But he's going to make errors. Everybody on this team at some point in time is going to make an error or two. It is just inevitable. Does that mean Victor Scott's not a plus defender in center field? No. Does he look confident and comfortable every time he's coming in on a ball or going back on a ball? Maybe not. The routes, I think, could be, you know, there's some things that are going to need to be cleaned up. But he's a kid. He's 23 years old. He's playing his first major league action, and he's looked pretty darn good. He looks like he's holding his own, more than holding his own defensively. He's saved his pitchers outs already, saved them runs already. He gave one back on Wednesday. It sucks. Yes, you can trace back the notion that the Cardinals in part lost the game because of it and because of the base running blunder. But I said it earlier, and I'm going to say it again. I like that the Cardinals are not overreacting to this and sending him back. Again, if you're going to already kind of have it in the motion to send him back when Newpar returned, when he was ready, if that was the game plan, well, first of all, they would have played Newpar in center field this week in Springfield. That didn't happen, at least to my knowledge. He was, he was in left field, and then tonight I, he was slated to be in right. If something changed on the Springfield Cardinals, I can try and find that out. But I saw their lineup when they posted it earlier tonight. He was in right field. So if that was what you were going to do, oh, no, they, they were rained out Wednesday. So Newpar didn't even play. Well, shoot, man. That's a bummer. <laughs> I, I don't know if Newt's going to play Thursday. Like, Katie wouldn't have this. And she reported it earlier Wednesday. She wouldn't have this if it weren't wheels in motion. So Newpar is going to meet the team in Arizona it is almost certainly what's going to happen. Or he, you know, they got wind of, of hey, this game's not going to happen tonight in Springfield. Drive on up to St. Louis and, and fly out with the team. I don't know what the circumstances of that were. But Katie reported it, so I think we can believe it to be true that Newpar is going to be in that lineup on Friday. She reports also that Pedro Pajas is going to be the corresponding move. What's interesting about that is it must mean that the Cardinals have confidence that Wilson Contreras is going to be ready to catch by Friday. He was the DH in the game on Wednesday. Herrera was behind the plate again. Herrera, by the way, has got an 875 OPS. Uh, Wilson's got an 894, and Donovan's got an 884. Those are the three guys on this team that are really consistently hitting. Those guys have been doing some work. They're carrying the lumber. Herrera and Donovan with home runs today. Wilson had a one for three, scored a run, also reached via walk. So I don't know what the plan is going to be to get those two, Herrera and Contreras, into as many lineups at the same time as you can. 
but I think you're going to have to do it. I, I don't think it's a big deal not to have the third catcher if Pajes is the, the corresponding move, as Katie reports. I think that's fine if Wilson can catch, though. You, you don't want to go out to Arizona and only have one guy on the roster that can actually get behind the plate. Cardinals get the off day on Thursday. I have to assume that they feel good enough about where Wilson Contreras was leaving the ballpark Wednesday to believe that he's going to be ready to go to catch by Friday. It doesn't mean he will catch, but just the notion that he can frees you up to not have the third catcher, Pajes, um, taking up an active roster spot. They're not going to send Victor Scott down because the game plan was to continue prioritizing center field defense and defense in general. And I think Victor Scott is certainly a part of that. The Cardinals believe, and they've they've said it all the way going back to November, and maybe even you could find quotes of it before that. But the Cardinals believe that they're going to be at their best if Lars Nupar is their everyday left fielder. And maybe he'll play some right field as well. It's interesting that he was slated to play right field on Wednesday in Springfield before it looks like looking on their website that the game was postponed. I think that's a little bit interesting because we also know Jordan Walker is kind of struggling and there has been a contingent on social media that would say you got to send Walker down too. You know, I don't know what's going to happen with that. He is beating the ball into the ground. He's he's not coming up with the the big hits that they're looking for and he's a much better player than than the offensive numbers would indicate for him right now. I think that's true of a lot of guys on this team, but Walker's hitting 162 with a 481 OPS. He's better than that. He's going to be better than that. I don't necessarily think it's fair to just say every time a young player struggles, well, you got to send him down. It's not me saying that what Victor Scott's doing is acceptable offensively, but I also did say at one point in time, anything he gives you at the plate is a bonus. And boy, has he really tested that theory a little bit lately, having the 0 for 24 before breaking out of it with an infield hit that he ends up getting thrown out on anyway. So that is what I said. Anything he gives you is a bonus offensively. He does have six runs scored, which is among team leaders. It's not the team lead, but it's relatively high on the list. That's pretty hard to do with an 091 batting average and an on-base as low as his. But that is what his speed can do. If his defense can continue to be consistent. And look, if you go out to Arizona, and that's a somewhat spacious outfield, if it doesn't end up going well and, and looking right for him defensively, then I do think at some point you make a change. But I think it sends the wrong message for the Cardinals to say, oh, it's convenient with New Park coming back. Hey, you can plug him into center field. Hey, Alec Burleson's starting to swing the bat well, and people on Twitter got mad at me for saying he's swinging the bat well, even though he objectively, I mean, he had five hits in the Philly series. Does that mean he's some superstar? Everybody calm down. He's in 256 on the season, a 601 OPS, a long way to go. But if he keeps swinging it like he did against Philadelphia, I mean, he was, he was spraying balls all over the field. Several of them hard hit. He had five total hits in the series. I like what, what we saw from Alec Burleson in this series. But the Cardinals are going to be compelled to go, well, if we're going new par in center and we get, we get Burley's lineup uh, or his bat in the lineup, I should say, maybe that's at left field. Maybe sometimes it's DH, but you also want to get Herrera in there. Like it's just, there's a lot of, a lot of moving parts. And Donovan could play left field and I get that. I don't know what the answer is going to be on how you get all these guys in the lineup at once. The answer is going to be that you can't. But I think the one spot that I, I still wouldn't compromise is center field defense. Because for as much as Lance Lynn can strike out six in five innings and and may not always need to pitch to contact, you got guys like Miles Michaelis, Kyle Gibson. These guys are going to pitch to contact. It's just it's just in their nature, especially in the case of Miles. I think if you want to have your best version of Miles, you continue to put your best defense behind him. And, and the Cardinals played pretty good defense for Miles in his last start. I I just think that is a key to success if you're the St. Louis Cardinals in 2024. So is Victor Scott that answer? I think certainly for the time being, he is. Now, could I see a world in which you could you could make an argument for Michael Ciani to just play every day in center field? Because I think he's a pretty darn good defensive outfielder too. We haven't really seen him in center. Victor's played every game. I thought today, I said on the podcast last night that I thought maybe Victor Scott wouldn't play on Wednesday that it would be an off day for him. The way they've given, they gave Mason win and they Paul Goldschmidt got a day. I thought this would be a game where we didn't even see Victor Scott. It turns out we saw him and maybe that's the other angle on this. I, I don't like to just point fingers and, and, and say, Hey, this is the smoking gun of what happened and why the Cardinals lost the game because they play 162 of these. And if you hyper analyze every single one, you're going to run yourself a little bit crazy, but that that is what we do. I acknowledge that. That's what we do on the podcast. When we talk about every game, these things are 
these conversations are going to come up as long as we can keep them within context and not go too crazy about the narratives of it. But I think if you're going to allow guys like Mason Wynn to they, they get their legs and get their rest, and, and Wynn did come in later in the game for Crawford in, in, in Wednesday's game. But I would look at Victor Scott and be like, man, he's played like every game. Maybe Wednesday would have been a, been a day, day game after a night game, that you could have thrown Siani in center field and, 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 and taken a look at how that how that would play out. And so it's not me saying like, well, Victor Scott was obviously, they ran him ragged and that's why he played bad today. That's not what I mean. But it was one one of those deals that I kind of thought you might see Siani in center field. But if the Cardinals want to have their best put forward defensively, I still think for now that is Victor Scott. It's having Newt Bar in left field. It's figuring out what right field is going to look like. If Jordan Walker can hit more, that would be great. I think it is going to happen at some point. But you could put Burleson, you know, you could maybe platoon that a little bit at times. Burleson can play a little bit of right field. And in either case, it's going to be Siani for late innings if you're trying to hold a lead, that he can come in defensively. Newt Bar, Victor Scott, Siani, I don't think the Cardinals are, are going to be able to come up with a better defensive outfield than that one. Donovan plays a good left field, but I think Newt Bar, more of a natural outfielder, is going to have more upside there. So there's a possibility to have that be a late inning defense. And I like that Michael Ciani is is safe from this cut line as well. I wanted to see Pajes get a little bit more of a look, but it was inevitable that he was the third catcher that was just there in case of an emergency. He played a little bit in the game on Sunday, and that was really it. But I think Ciani brings an element to the team as well that w- with with what you're considering as the alternatives, I think Ciani having him around is probably to your benefit because you can turn that outfield defense into just a bunch of ball hawks out there in, in the late innings at least strategically, the the way you could align that thing. I like it. And, and it's nice to have a guy with speed on the bench to be a pinch runner, uh, whatever the case. And Michael Ciani's, you know, taking his walks. He's got a 760 OPS. Uh, part of that because of the triple that he hit the other day ends up boosting your OPS. But I don't mind that he's still on the team. The thing that I think is important from this, and again, we're basing this off of Katie's reporting because he can trust it. I think it's nice that the Cardinals can have a game like this, a series like this, where, man, it just kind of gets away from you. You lose two out of three, and it feels like you could have swept them in all reality. And then in Wednesday's game, it's your rookie that's already been struggling at the plate that people are already saying, ah, oh, they rushed him. They, they shouldn't have brought him up yet. Maybe they shouldn't have. But I think with the circumstances, it was reasonable to say, hey, let's give this kid a shot. And I think other than really just uh, the, the bottom kind of dropping out on him today, he's been able to handle and separate out what's going on at the plate versus what's going on in the field. And there have even been some bright moments at the plate that don't show up in, in an 091 batting average. Again, when you get a sacrifice fly to drive in a run, that doesn't show. And I and you could obviously make this argument for every player that you wanted to try and have an agenda and say, hey, it's not as bad as it looks. So I'm going to acknowledge both sides on that. But I also think this idea that the Cardinals are, as a, as a team, they're 6-7 and seven because, well, they're nine-hole hitters hitting 091. I don't think that's accurate. I think they I think today was a tough one. Today, if you have Siani in center, if you have if you have Victor just catch that ball in the first inning, it may be a completely different outcome to this game. But if I'm going to pin Wednesday on one thing, it's the same thing that I'm going to pin Monday on. And honestly, the majority of the Cardinals' seven losses to this point in the season, and that is the offense. They scored three runs again in this game on Wednesday. They lose it four to three. This is a Cardinal team. I said it before. I'm going to say it again. I feel like I'm going to continue to say it the more times they lose 4 to 3, 5 to 3, etc. This was a Cardinal team that was built in order to succeed. They need to be winning these 6 to 5 games, the 5 to 4 games. They're right now losing those games 5 to 3 and 4 to 3 in the Philadelphia series. That's the way that it went. They need to score 5 or 6 runs a game more often than they don't. And to this point they've played 11 games, they're 6 and 7. I believe it's been 7 of the 11 games that the Cardinals have scored three or fewer runs so far this season. That is not going to work. I know that you're only 13 games in, but each day that we do a podcast, I'll be able to say, I know you're only 16 games. I know it's only been 19. I know it's only 25 games. I know we're only 31 games into this season. Eventually, they're going to be what they are, right? And so at 13 games into the season, it's not a representative sample size, but there is also an angle to this where I think you could look at it and say, hey, if it continues to go this way offensively for the Cardinals, I don't think it's going to be sustainable for them to be able to win the 85, 87 games that are going to be required to uh, to win this division or to 
to ideally at least sneak in with a wild card. The Cardinals have scored exactly three runs in five consecutive games. They beat the Marlins 3-1 to one on Saturday. They lost 10-3 to three Sunday. They lose 5-3 to three Monday. They win 3 to nothing on Tuesday. And then today, on Wednesday, they lose 4-3. to three. That's five games in a row. Um, they scored two on Wednesday, April 3rd. So I might have even undersold it. And then their first two games of the season, they scored one and three. So that is eight of the 13 games the Cardinals have played this season. They have scored three or fewer runs. And it's nice that a lot of those games are exactly three. So at least you can win a, a pitcher's duel. The Cardinals aren't built to win all too many pitcher's duels. They're built to win five to four. They're built to win six to four. They're built to win six to five. They're built to have a pitching staff that's going to get quality starts or is going to have those those Lance Lynn five innings, zero runs. It would have been zero if not for the unearned runs. Five innings, two runs. But if you're going five and you're giving up two, that keeps you in it. The bullpen, and this is something that I think Cardinals fans need to hear. The bullpen is not at the end of the season going to finish with a 0.0 ERA. Not one bullpen in Major League Baseball will. So when you have a bullpen that goes four innings today, and it had to because Lynn only went five, it goes those four innings coming on the heels of a of a, of a game last night on Tuesday where they had a starter going 64 pitches because he was on a pitch count, and they found a way to ride the rail and use their leverage relievers to get a win when they really needed one to set up the rubber game scenario. And then that's coming back off of Monday where you had to go extra innings, and so you had to burn the bullpen as a result of that. Yes, you have an off day coming Thursday and everybody will get their rest, but the bullpen was a little bit was a little bit on fumes as a result of the, the first couple of games of the series. And thank goodness for what Kyle Gibson did. I know you roll your eyes at it on Sunday. It matters that he went six innings, Cardinal fans. It really does. And the, think about how close the margins were. Even with the bullpen being used up the way that it was, it would have been far worse, obviously, if Gibson had gone three innings instead of six in that game on Sunday. But think about how close the margins were in the series to where the Cardinals could have won the thing two out of three or even swept the series. If the Cardinals were just just primed with where they need to be offensively and where they need to be in, in all facets of the game and, and doing that more consistently, which is easier said than done, every team's out there trying to execute. So if you don't, that means the other team probably did and vice versa. But if the Cardinals were in that spot in the series, they sweep it. They win three games in a row. And it would have been largely because of, sounds crazy, but Kyle Gibson going six. Him going six Sunday sets up the bullpen to be overstretched in the way that it was in games one and two of this series. It gets overstretched. It happens in vain on Monday, which is unfortunate. And then it happens a little bit in vain on on Wednesday. But really, it was mostly just you were able to hold back Zach Thompson because of Sonny Gray's ability to go five. So Zach Thompson was able to push from from planning to pitch on Tuesday to now he can throw his three-plus innings on Wednesday. Palante doesn't do his job. But you can look at this bullpen throughout Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of this series. Is he the only guy in, in, in happening only in game three that didn't do their job? The bullpen was largely very good in this series. I think if you look at the Palante outing from today and go, see, Marmel should have known. Marmel can't manage a bullpen. You are out of your mind or you're just not paying attention. And you're not paying any mind to the nuance of how this works. Andre Palante is on the team. He's had some good outings. He's had some bad outings. It, it, I just cannot do it every single night when a reliever gives up runs. It's Ollie Marmel's fault because he should have known not to bring him in. Got to listen to how you sound with that, Cardinals fans. That's the, that's the one pet peeve. I guess I've probably got more pet peeves than that. But the reality is if a guy's on the roster, he's eligible to pitch. And when everybody else pitched the last two days, and it's a it, whatever the situation, I know Cardinals fans would say, well, he, he, Ollie's got to know he can't pitch against righties. Like, the bullpen is the bullpen, and guys are going to have to fill roles that occasionally it's not the most conducive matchup. And yeah, maybe Zach Thompson could have been the answer, and it, and we'd be talking about a different situation. But I also don't think you expect Andre Pallante to go out there and have a full outing without recording an out. That's not something a manager is going to bake in going into a, going into a game. But even with that, you can look at the bullpen performance on Wednesday and say they went four innings and gave up two runs. It's not amazing. It's a 4.50 ERA is what that would paint out to be. And if that was your bullpen ERA, well, you wouldn't be among the, the, the better bullpens in baseball. But like we're talking about from the starters perspective, hey, if they could just go six and three, six innings, give up three runs, that would be the same thing, a 4.50 ERA. 
I know we all want to see bullpen guys come out and just be lights out every single time. Inevitably, you look at everybody up and down that bullpen and every other bullpen in Major League Baseball, at the end of the year, they're all going to have ERAs. And those ERAs are not going to be 0.00 because they'll have games where they give up runs. That's the that's the nature of it. This expectation that every bullpen guy should come in and always throw up a zero is not realistic. It should happen more often than it doesn't. And for the guys that struggle with that concept, they end up getting, they'll get demoted at some point, right? But I just, I, it's exhausting to think that, well, it, the bullpen cost the Cardinals a game today. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. The bullpen went four innings and gave up two runs. Unfortunately, Palante didn't have it today. But that was still enough to keep this Cardinals team in it if the way they're designed to hit happens. And I guess you could say, well, maybe they just scored a fourth run if Victor Scott didn't have the, the blunder of base running. Sure, I get that. More often than not, this Cardinals team's got to hit five. They've got to get to five. Or they've got to get to four in regulation because a lot of times they're going to give up specifically four runs. They're going to give up that number in a lot of games because the starter's going to go six or seven and give up two or three runs, and the bullpen's going to either give up none, or they're going to give up one, or they're going to give up two like they did today when the starter gives up two, and there's your four. And so you can match them, and then you got to find a way to win it in the extra innings. Five's going to be a key number, but three is going to be the number that doesn't cut it. Not often enough. The Cardinals have cut it with three a few times this year. They have also lost with three a number of times this year. Because I think as much as the bullpen can be a solid one and has and had a good series despite what Palante had going for him on Wednesday. And as much as I think the rotation can be solid, I mean middle of the pack. I'm I'm I've been impressed, man. I have been impressed with this rotation. I think Lance Lynn can be a guy with an ERA in the threes. I think it may be high threes, but if it's three eight, three nine, I think that's realistic. I think it's possible. Now, that may not end up coming to fruition if there's a game where he's just got to eat it when he doesn't have his best stuff and he gives up five home runs and it's a derby, and that's going to, you know, obviously inflate the ERA. But I think generally you can look at him as being like a, a really sturdy number three in a competent rotation. I think the same thing about Miles Michaelis. You know, uh, he's, he's effectively their number two, but... I think Miles can be a really, really good three and a, and a passable number two. I think Sonny Gray can be an ace, can be an, a, a leader of a rotation. I look at Steven Matz. I think if they continue to manage him, yes, it's going to be a little more strain on your bullpen if the guy's only throwing 85, 88 pitches. But I also think he can probably have an ERA in the threes the way that he's the way that he's looked so far. So, like, you're looking at this rotation and suddenly going, hey, it may, may not be as bad as you thought. We'll see what Kyle Gibson ends up being. He still gave up the seven runs. Those count. His ERA is probably going to be 4.7, 4.8, just like it was last year. In all honesty, that's what I would expect. That's what I said before the year. He's going to be what he's been. But what he's been, that's why he, in my mind, is kind of penciled in as your number five. And he's going to have days where he's he's sharp and gives you a, a real chance to win like he did in his opener, his first outing. And then he's going to have days where he gives up six in the first. But he says, look, guys, I know this is on me to get you through. And so he's going to throw six innings. That's a difference compared to what they had last year in their rotation. But I'm using all of this to kind of frame it in such a way that's like, even if we want to be optimistic about where this rotation and the bullpen and the pitching staff as a whole is going to end up, let's say optimistically, they could be at number 12. They're the the 12th best pitching staff in baseball. Well, that puts you right on the borderline of being a playoff team, unless the other elements of your team are better. And the defense, I think, needs to be a top... 10 to 12 type of defense when it all when it's all settled and when it's all said and done. I think that's what you need to end up having. And and that's going to feed into whether or not your pitching staff is as good as you want it to be. Because that the the defense is going to make the pitching staff because of how much pitch to contact you do still have in that rotation. But then beyond that, it's what's your offense going to be. And so if this Cardinals offense ends up being good, the Cardinals are going to be good. If the Cardinals offense isn't good, you better hope the pitching stays as good as it's been on the rotation front because that's got them hovering right around 500 and maybe a little bit below with right now them being at six and seven. If the rotation has some injuries or it takes a step back from where it's been from the bar that it's set early on and the offense is just what we're seeing so far with a team that's going to, you know, finish in the bottom 10 in OPS. I mean, that's not going to work out. So what's this offense going to be for the St. Louis Cardinals? I think internally, if they look at it, they see the couple of home runs today. They see guys coming around. They know that it's going to be an Arenado and Goldie thing. As those two guys go, so will go the ceiling of this group. How much helium can this offense find? But there have been other guys that are starting to put it together. And I think one through nine, they do have talent. 
It's just there's too many guys slumping at the same time to begin the season. So it's not that it's panic mode for the offense, but it's this continual reminder that if this is the offense, I don't think it is. I think the offense will be better than this. I don't think we're seeing top five. I said they needed to be top five, top six. Maybe it's more like top eight, top ten, and I still think they can reach that that level if they can get some some guys who are slumping out of it and they can stay healthy with with the guys that are at the other positions. But it's this continual reminder that if it doesn't happen, this Cardinal team's not making the playoffs. I don't think they can pitch their way to the playoffs this year with a with a 17th best offense or 18th and run scored, which is about where they are right now, at least when I looked earlier today. There's probably some night games that have changed that. But this Cardinal team is built to win by consistently getting you to four, five, six runs. And 8 of 13, they've scored three or fewer. So the fact that they're 6 and 7 right now, honestly, it could be a lot worse than it is. It could certainly be a lot better than it is, but the way that it would have gotten better is by this team coming out of the gate a little bit more strongly offensively than it has done so. Let me know what you think, Cardinals fans, about the way things stand here at 6-7 and seven for the team. What do you think about the, the, the decision, essentially, that was reported by Katie Wu that Victor Scott's not going anywhere just yet? He's going to be on this team, and if he's going to be on this team, he's going to be the primary center fielder. You may get a, a, a stray start, uh, start for Siani. I can't talk. You may get a stray start for Siani in center field, maybe even a stray new bar start if they really want to mix Donovan and Burleson and, and maybe even Avon Herrera all into the same lineup somehow. they got to figure out ways to do that. But I think it's mostly going to be Victor Scott and the fact that they get the off day on Thursday. You don't really need to sit him Friday. Wednesday might have been the day to sit him. Didn't happen, but I think he can be refreshed, recharged, and if anything, he's going to want to get right back out there. That's why I like that the Cardinals aren't sending him down after this because this was the worst game of his major league career. He knows it, but he took responsibility and said, this is what I got to do differently. I know that's a play that needs to be made. I know that's something that I can't do around the bases. Like He's on top of it and aware of it, and he's going to own it and take responsibility for it. He's not going to make an excuse about it. And I think that there's an element. Like If you're talking about worrying about a guy's development by him being rushed to the big leagues, I don't think you can then turn around and say it doesn't matter how the Cardinals handle this situation after he has an objectively bad game at the stuff he was supposed to be good at. And and let me say as an aside, is good at. He is a good defensive fielder. He is a great base runner. He had a bad day in those categories, but that's not who he is as a player. I think making a, a decision, unless you were already planning to do it because of the offense and you just think, hey, in our organizational opinion, he's too overmatched in the benefit that he brings you in the field. It doesn't counterbalance what's happening at the plate right now, which is not how I feel still, even with the way that he's been hitting. He scored you six runs this year. How many guys on your team have done that? I know that's an oversimplification, but I just don't believe that he's put the Cardinals in as bad of a spot as an 091 batting average would indicate. And I think the way that they handled this could have the exact effect that it needs to have in terms of instilling confidence in a guy. You talk about worrying about his development and if he comes up and he's he's struggling the way that he has objectively so far and he goes down to AAA, it ruins him forever because he struck out, you know, a dozen times against big league hitters or, pardon me, big league pitchers who are better than him at that point in his career. I don't think that's going to ruin a guy's development. I, I don't. I just don't. It's not a fear that I have in my soul about Victor Scott II, especially not the way that he carries himself, the way that he approaches the game and goes about it. I don't think it's going to be an issue. That being said, if I were a big league player, which I never was, never will be, didn't have the skill set. But if I were in that spot and I had the worst day at my job, don't want anyone to have the worst day at their job. And if you picked up on that reference, comment in the YouTube comment section below because it's my favorite Netflix show, one of my favorite Netflix shows that I just referenced there. If that was the case for me, and I would get sent down as a result of that game. And the Cardinals could say, there's always a way to frame it, right? They could say, hey, with New Park coming back, it's not it's not because of Wednesday, Vic. It's because, you know, we just see some things that you could be doing offensively that we want to we want to give you the, the terrain to work on in the minors before we bring you back up later on this year. You could frame it in, in the most, you know, loving of ways. But if that was the game that was in the back of your mind, that's the thing that can harm a development of a player. That's just my opinion. If you if you have that kind of day where you know you weren't yourself, you know these are the things you're good at and you struggled at them. 
If the Cardinals organizational philosophy is, hey, we'll give you a chance until that, and we can't stand for that. One bad day, defensively or base running or both in this instance, nope, we can't stand for that. You're gone. All right. And you're going to talk to me about development, and that's going to be your argument? Give me a break. That's not what the Cardinals should have done here. That's not me saying, let's be clear here, that's not me saying that I think Victor Scott should be the center fielder the rest of the season in St. Louis, regardless of what he does offensively. And that's not me saying that he should even be the center fielder in St. Louis for the rest of the month. I don't think you send him down after a game like the one he just had. It would have almost been an easier argument if he had gone 0 for 3, so no infield hit, but it made every play in center field and had had obviously not had the base running situation happen to him because it wouldn't have been a base hit. If that game had happened and you were the Cardinals and you wanted to send him down, I'd actually have less of a problem with it than if they were to do it right in this moment for Lars Newpar. Because that would tell me, look, they've made the organizational decision and it's not a rash call because of what happened in this game on Wednesday. So Ali Marmo completely had Victor Scott's back in the postgame. Said he made an error. He's gonna make he's gonna make more. It's the big leagues. It happens. I thought that was the right approach. Let me know what you think, Cardinals fans. Do you think Victor Scott should still be on the team? Do you think that maybe he could use more seasoning, but that, that like me, I don't think this was the time to send him out, especially now that you finally have a chance to put that outfield defense together that you envisioned. It's Victor standing in for Tommy Edmond, but it's basically the same otherwise, flanked by Lars Newtbar and Jordan Walker. I think that's what this pitching staff needs and can benefit from from a defensive standpoint in the outfield. So until Tommy Edmond or, or Dylan Carlson gets back, and look, if you want to decide that, hey, there are some things that Victor Scott can do on a day where we give him a day and it's going to be Siani this day that plays, but Victor Scott's going to work on this or that because maybe the hitting coaches have found something that he can kind of, maybe that's something you could you could approach. But otherwise, I think you put him out there and you hopefully get Tommy Edmond or Dylan Carlson back soon. And if the defense starts to consistently slide for Vic, then you say, hey, man, don't hang your head. We're going we're gonna to make a move with this. But I thought the Cardinals having his back in this moment was an important moment to do that. You may disagree with the fact that he should be here at all because you might think he's not ready. But I think if he was going to be here, that's not the game you send him down after. That's not the message you want to send if you're an organization. That's my opinion on it. I respect if anybody else has a different one, but I wouldn't have done it. And then you could say, well, when do you send him down, right? Just You just let him play the Arizona series to make him feel good. And then if after, you know, after an 0 for 9 or a 1 for 9 or whatever it ends up being, let's say he doesn't make any errors, but then you send him down then, is that much better? I think so. Yeah. I mean, if you wanted to do that, I, I could understand it. I think it's also going to depend on how competent does he look in every aspect of the game is he, is he keeping that swagger of, of that confidence of that, hey, I'm the guy and I can be the guy? Don't worry about what my batting average is. Does he look the part? Is he handling himself appropriately? That's a decision that the team can come to based on watching him day to day. And then what is it for Dylan Carlson and Tommy Edmond? Because I don't think we see Dylan in, in April. I'd be shocked if he's available in April. Just reading tea leaves. All that is is reading tea leaves on the vibes of kind of the slow play of his recovery. Tommy being able to swing for both sides of the plate is interesting. Could that be something to where within a, a week to 10 days, he's ramped up and facing live pitching already, or at least, you know, some, some, some more substantial BP and then maybe a rehab assignment late April. Maybe that's possible for the timeline, but I've made the commentary that I'm going to consider anything that Edmund gives you in the first half of the season, a bonus, not because I don't think Tommy Edmund is great. I think he's great. I think the circumstances of his wrist have been such that you just need to kind of approach with caution. You can't count the chickens before they hatch with this one. So where does that leave the Cardinals? Well, if they're going to continue with the organizational philosophy that was established, I thought in the off season with everything that they said, and then what they did to back it up, that defense matters. And we're going to prioritize the way this thing looks in center field and, and, and give Jordan Walker, you know, a, a little bit of extra opportunity to, to grow into his own and become the right fielder that he needs to be by having a guy that's going to catch every ball to his, you know, to his right side with Victor playing center, then I, I think it makes sense to keep Victor Scott up right now. Yes, it would be freaking great if Vic could have a two for five at some point or a two for four just so we could stop talking about the batting average. But I've seen the types of at-bats that I think that's a possibility. 
if he's if he had beat out two extra infield hits, and it seems like every time he hits a grounder on the infield, he's a half step away from beating it out, or he actually does beat it out. If he had two more and he was, you know, hitting 130 instead of 090, or he, you know, was able to to have a double just at one point, have an extra base hit that would that would boost the slug and make the OPS look a little bit less gnarly. Are we talking about it in the same way, or are we going, yeah, look at his numbers? I think we're just getting grip lock with the number. It's a bad batting average. It's not a sustainable one. I get it. I don't think that's the hitter he's going to be, and I don't think leaving him up here for three more weeks is necessarily going to resign him to a lifetime of hitting 091 in the big leagues because when he goes down to AAA, I trust that he's going to be able to make the adjustments and recognize that, hey, that didn't go well. But in the same way that Mason Wynn hit 150 or whatever it was last September, he can come up have some struggle, go back and figure some things out. And Mason didn't have to even go back. He just needed an offseason, got acclimated, and he's looking like a like an everyday guy. So those are my thoughts on the Victor thing. It, it, it overshadowed what we could be talking about, which how great it is that Newt Bar is going to be back. Because when you're talking about this offense, maybe he's a spark that you put him in the middle, you bump Nolan Gorman down a little bit, gives you some protection now, kind of one through six, one through seven even, if you can get Herrera in there as well. And Herrera should be batting against uh, above Jordan Walker. I saw comments of like, well, why is Walker batting eighth? I don't know. Look at the numbers. Well, why doesn't that apply to Goldsmith and Arenado? Because it doesn't. Like, I, I don't know. I don't I don't know that we have to spell it out every single time a lineup decision is made. But th- those guys have a little bit more cash day in the league. And their their lineup spots are a little bit more written in pen. Whereas Jordan is, is a, a young player that's, yeah, opportunities are ultimately earned at this level. And when he started really heating up last year, he was batting in the middle of the order. I think Jordan is going to be a middle-order hitter before it's all said and done. Right now, there are guys with more of a pedigree or are performing better at this present time than Jordan Walker, and so he's going to bat lower. Those guys are going to bat higher. It's no more complicated than that. But I think getting Newt back can be huge. Just from the energy standpoint that he brings, the on-base that he brings, the the pitchers are going to feel it when that guy gets on base because... It's a it's a another situation with runners on that they got to figure out. Maybe instead of a guy on first, you got first and second because Newt drew a walk or whatever it's going to be. That's going to help everybody. In particular, I think it can help Goldsmith and Arenado to have Newt hopefully batting up there as a table setter to you know just kind of bring that extra element to this lineup. I don't know exactly where he's going to bat. Donovan should continue to lead off, in my opinion. He had his second home run today. I tweeted out asking how many he hits if he has a fully healthy season. I think 15 is a reasonable expectation. He does have some power. He's a very, very quality leadoff hitter who also can can change the game with one swing. So that's exciting for the Cardinals to have a guy like that. There's a chance that just getting Newt back, and then suddenly you see Nolan. Nolan's on a hit streak. Arnado's on a hit streak. He just doesn't have the power. If he nukes one in Arizona, Goldsmith will probably homer in Arizona because it always seems like he does going back to face his old team. Suddenly you're going... Wait, this Cardinal offense, one through seven, is kind of ridiculous. One through eight, Mason win. And Victor Scott gets a couple infield hits. And, oh, my gosh, one through nine, they're really rolling. They're not far from that being the case. So the panic about the offense is premature if you're thinking it's done and cooked and dusted. But the the continual casual reminders of, hey, remember, the offense does have to be very good or the Cardinals won't be, I think that is still very much a relevant point to make. So as long as we're keeping those context, uh, th- those pieces of context, I think, separate and and being aware of them, I think it's okay to to kind of talk about where the Cardinals are at right now. It's a bit of a bummer that they're they're not above 500 because you can look at most of their losses outside of the one against the Marlins on Sunday and go, oh, man, they almost had that one. Like, I, I think f- maybe four games of the seven, you could go, yeah, they probably should have won. Now they've had some close ones that they were able to win that the other team probably came away from going, oh, man, we gave that game away. We shouldn't have let them have that game. So that context, again, you got to remember that these things happen on both sides, but the best teams are going to do it more to them than they get it done to them. So that's kind of the way I look at it for the Cardinals right now. I've gone nearly an hour. I had I had some ranting, I guess, to do tonight, but I appreciate you guys for listening. Uh, obviously, with the off day on Thursday, um, there won't be anything new necessarily to get into unless there are some more roster moves or some news or whatever. Uh, We could talk Jackson Holiday's debut. I don't know. Drop YouTube comments below. What do you want my channel to post on Thursday since there's not going to be really a whole lot new going on? What could we talk about? I want to do some evergreen videos 
some like top five kind of Cardinal history sort of stuff. I have not gotten the, the production on that just yet, but at some point I'd like to get into that sort of stuff. It's just kind of hard to find the time during the season. But we'll definitely be back covering the series uh, against uh, the Arizona Diamondbacks later on in the weekend. Off day Thursday. I will be recording, supposed to be recording, Low Hanging Fruit with Charlie for his YouTube channel, and I'll put it on the B-Shape Daily podcast feed too. That's supposed to happen on Thursday morning, so that's something to look forward to. Um, otherwise, drop your comments if you have suggestions. What should I be talking about on the channel on Thursday? That's going to do it, though, for this edition of the show. Appreciate you guys. As always, subscribe. Cardinals content all season long. We'll talk to you next time on Be Shaved Daily. Peace.